continuing our prophecy seminar number seven, and uh, it's the chapter, we're going through the book of Daniel in the Old Testament there, and we are on chapter uh, five, chapter five. So that number seven just means we had a couple of introductory lessons. And so we're on chapter five, and um, it's a very interesting uh, chapter. It's the fall of Babylon. Now we're in, still in this section of Daniel that is, uh, our, we call, call them the historical section of Daniel or the stories. And uh, so it, this is not necessarily a prophecy, but in a way it is because the stories in the book of Daniel actually help us understand the prophecies. And so what happened back there historically, even though it's a story, actually bears on what our day, and we're going to find that out because we're going to be comparing the book of Daniel to what book in the New Testament goes with the book of Daniel? Revelation, Revelation that's right, the book of Revelation. Uh, do, do, does everyone have a lesson, by the way? Lesson number seven, the fall of Babylon. If you don't, raise your hand. And there is also a handout that uh, goes with that, uh, this little handout right here. If you need one of those, we also have those as well. So please make sure you have a handout. And we have Bibles. Uh, if you need a Bible to look up, because we're going to be looking up texts, and uh, some of them will be on the screen, but um, we have <clears throat> these, th these lessons are written with the King James Version Bible in, in mind, and so the, the blanks in there will match up to the King James Version. Uh, so these Bibles that we have are that version. All right. Now, if you need a binder to put your lessons in as we're collecting these week by week, you know, there's, there's quite a few lessons, so you, these binders come in handy. If you want a binder, we have those. See us afterwards so you can put your lessons into those binders. Also, we have pens if you need a pen to write with because you want to write in your answers uh, as we go along. All right, so let's, um, <clears throat> let's begin with prayer and then we will get into our lesson. Dear Father, we ask your Holy Spirit to teach us, Lord, and to reveal to us what you would have us to know and to give us the wisdom and the courage to make changes in our lives by your power to bring glory and honor to you. We thank you in Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, so we're gonna do a little quick quiz here before we go into our today's lesson. This is about last week's lesson. And if you remember last week, it was the previous chapter in the book of Daniel, chapter 4, and it was about the conversion of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. All right, so our first qu quiz question is, the only chapter in the book of Daniel that was not written by Daniel himself is chapter 4. It was written by Nebuchadnezzar. Is that true or false? That's true. It's true. That's a, did you know that, by the way? that there was Nebuchadnezzar himself. Imagine that. Uh, here Nebuchadnezzar is a pagan king taking God's people captive, destroying the temple in Jerusalem, and it looks like everything is just going down for God's side. And here, four chapters later, Nebuchadnezzar ends up being converted to the God of Daniel. Amazing. All right, number two. God allowed Nebuchadnezzar to go insane because he wanted him to make fun of him. <laughs> That's false. Uh, he did allow him to go insane, but for the reason of uh, making, allowing him to become converted, actually. Uh, it's a very interesting story. We have lessons, by the way, from previous lessons. If you've missed any, we have last week's lesson. And uh, you can go online on our church website as well if you want to see the presentation uh, in video form. All right, number three, as a result of this insanity, Nebuchadnezzar was humbled. When he recovered, he acknowledged the God of heaven as the true God. That's true, that's right. Number four, God saves people by grace plus works that they are able to do. That's false. Yeah, that sounds good, but it's not quite true, is it? God doesn't save us. But our works do not save us. Now, our works are important, but those do, that's not what saves us. All right. Um, and we learned that last week, by the way. 
Number five, the word believe means to have implicit trust in Jesus Christ and to put our full weight on him. That's true. All right, very good. Now, as we get into today's lesson, let's, let's point out this fact right here. Revelation, the book of Revelation, warns what happened 2,500 years ago in ancient Babylon will be repeated in the last days. These historical stories are prophetic. So this is the key point here. So as we're going through this story in, uh, of what happened 2,500 years ago, look for clues as to how this applies to our day. And uh, we'll talk about that some more. So today's lesson is uh, our the fall of Babylon. Okay, the last night of Babylon. That's what we're going to be looking at here. And um, so let's see here. Get our lesson study guide go ready. All right, so I'm going to read this paragraph at the top of your lesson. I want to stay pretty close to the lesson so we don't get off track. It says, God is patient with people and nations. This is clear from his dealings with Nebuchadnezzar. Yet there comes a time when God must ring down the curtain if there is no response. It happens to individuals. It happens to nations. God bore along with ancient Babylon, giving revelation after revelation of himself. Nebuchadnezzar responded, but his successors did not. Daniel 5 portrays the final night of ancient Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar is dead. Belshazzar, the successor of Nebuchadnezzar, sits upon the throne, co-regent with Nebuchadnezzar, his father. In this lesson, we will observe the events surrounding the last night of Babylon. We will notice how the New Testament takes these events and applies them to what is called modern Babylon or spiritual Babylon and predicts a similar fall for it. Revelation warns that what happened 2,500 years ago in ancient Babylon will be repeated in the last days. All right, very good. Now, let's go and let's have our first question here. The first question is, list five things that Belshazzar did that defied the God of heaven. Now, who's Belshazzar? He's the king of Babylon. He, his, his father, or grandfather actually, was Nebuchadnezzar. And uh, so we have a new king in, in, in Babylon, and uh, Belshazzar is his name. All right, so here we go. We're going to read, we're going to read all the way through this chapter uh, in, in bits and pieces, so we won't lose anything here. All right, so Daniel 5, beginning verse 1, it says, Belshazzar, the king, made a great feast to a thousand of his lords and drank wine before the thousand. Belshazzar, whilst he tasted the wine, commanded to bring the golden and silver vessels which his father Nebuchadnezzar had taken out of the temple which was in Jerusalem, that the king and his princes, his wives, and his concubines might drink therein. Then they brought the golden vessels that were taken out of the temple of the house of God, which was at Jerusalem. And the king and his princes, his wives, and his concubines drank in them. They drank wine and praised who? The gods of gold and of silver, of brass, of iron, of wood, and of stone. In the same hour came forth fingers of a man's hand and wrote over against the candlestick upon the plaster of the wall of the king's palace. And the king saw the part of the hand that wrote. All right. That's a fascinating little start to our story, isn't it? Uh, interesting. Now, so the king is throwing a big, huge party. And he has a thousand of his lords there all the rulers of the, of the kingdom of Babylon, and he is there celebrating the greatness and the power of his kingdom and of his might. And they are, what do they do? They go and they get the vessels, the sacred vessels that had been taken years before by his grandfather Nebuchadnezzar out of the temple of God in Jerusalem, take those and bring them into that debauched party 
and they put wine in there and they drank out of those. And who did they praise? The gods of sil gold and silver and so forth and so on. Wow. All right. That's not a good situation, is it? Okay, so our qu answering our question, we're going to go right down here, A, B, C, D, E. Uh, it says, Belshazzar made a great, what? Feast in defiance of the God of heaven. So there, there's, you, you see the answer in red. You can write that in your blank in your lesson there. So we just, we just read that in the Bible, didn't we? All right. And then B, he drank, what did he drink? Wine, Wine before the thousand. Now, all these are key points because when we go to Revelation, we see in Revelation that there, Babylon, there's a symbol there of Babylon, and they're drinking wine out of the, uh, something there as well. So we're going to tie all this together eventually. Okay, so he drank wine before the thousand uh, lords. And then C, he commanded to bring the golden and silver vessels out of the temple which was in Jerusalem. In other words, they'd been taken out of the temple years before, but they had kept them in storage there. And so they brought them in to this grand party. All right. Am I going too fast? Okay, good. Yes? <laughs> okay. Well, I'll try to uh, not go too fast or too slow. All right. D, the king and his princes and his wives and his concubines. Concubines, of course, are his, they're like wives, but um, yeah. Anyway, uh, that's what the uh, kings back there did, and uh, they had lots of the wives and so forth. All right, the king and his princes, his wives, and his concubines drank in those vessels. All right. Quite a party they were having. And they, e, they praised the gods of gold, of silver, of brass, of iron, of wood, and of stone. You know, all false worship uh, involves worshiping God's creation instead of the creator. Anything that points towards God's creation and puts that above God, that's idolatry. And so that's what we humans tend to do. And we do it too here in America. We worship gold in the sense that we worship the almighty dollar. And so on and so forth. You know the story. All right, so it's, it's uh, we're no better than they are, uh, as in general. So they're not praising the God of heaven who created these wonderful things. They're praising the actual things themselves or the gods they think are represented in those things. All right. Number two. We're ready to go on to our next question. In the midst of their blasphemy against God, what suddenly appeared and startled the entire assembly? Well, we, all, we, all, we already read verse 5, but we're going to read it again here. In the same hour came forth fingers of a man's hand and wrote over against the candlestick upon the plaster of the wall of the king's palace. And the king saw the part of the hand that wrote. Then the king's countenance was changed and his thoughts troubled him so that the joints of his loins were loosed and his knees smote one against another. That's quite a picture, isn't it? So this king here, is he's having a grand time and then suddenly he sees a hand that's just the hand itself over against the wall and is writing a, a, a certain writing there. And it causes him, it gets his attention right quick. He sobers up immediately, and he is terrified. His knees are knocking together. His face is changed. He, is, he knows this is trouble. This has to be something really serious. All right. So that's the fingers of a man's hand writing on the wall. That's our question here, number two. All right, so number three, who did the king call to interpret the writing? So he, did, he saw this writing up on the wall, but he couldn't interpret it. He, he, just, he saw the words, but he couldn't, you know, what do they mean? Uh, it didn't make sense to him. So who does he call to uh, try to figure out what's going on here? 
uh, chapter 5 and verse 7, it says, The king cried aloud to bring in the astrologers, the Chaldeans, and the soothsayers. And the king spake and said to the wise men of Babylon, Whosoever shall read this writing and show them me the interpretation thereof shall be clothed with scarlet and have a chain of gold about his neck, and he shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. Wow. So he is holding out some major incentive, isn't he? He wants this solved, this riddle solved. And he offers even the third place in the kingdom. And so, so what the answer is, the wise men of Babylon. Now, have we encountered the wise men of Babylon in our studies thus, thus far? Yes, we've seen them over and over again. And they keep showing up here. So this is significant. Uh, do we have wise men in Babylon today? Yes. So uh, are they connected with God? No. All right, let's keep going. Number four, what were... Were the wise men able to interpret the writing? Verse 8. Then came in all the king's wise men, but they could not read the writing, nor make known to the king the interpretation thereof. They couldn't even read it, let alone interpret it. So uh, this, is not, this is not good. It's not going well for the king. And so the answer there is no. They could not interpret it. All right. So... What we see here is that God is discrediting the wise men of Babylon. God is allowing all of this to happen in such a manner that it makes, it makes it very clear that all the wise men of the world don't have the answers ultimately. They may have a lot of knowledge, they may have a lot of wisdom perhaps in some things, but it's not the kind of wisdom that God would have us to have. And so this is actually discrediting the wise men. It's showing that they do not have the answers. Uh, and we can look at those texts there. Let's see what 1 Corinthians 2.14 says. Jump over there. 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 14. It says, but the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. Yeah. So the things of God, the wise men of, of the world do not understand them. They, these are things that are spiritually discerned. We have to be humble and connected with God in order to understand these things. All right. Uh, and then First First Timothy six twenty. Let's see what that says. First Timothy six verse twenty. O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoiding profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science, falsely so called. All right, so it, the Bible's warning us there. Paul's writing to Timothy there. He warns him against vain babblings and profane uh, sayings and science that is falsely so-called. In other words, it's not true science. There's a true science, but there's a false science as well. Okay, all right, back to our Daniel chapter 5. And let's see what uh, happens next here. We're going into that section of, of, the, of the, your lesson that, Bottom of page three there, Daniel interprets the writing. And uh, question number five, who suggested to the king that he call in Daniel? All right, let's look at verses 10 through 12. Now, when the, now the queen, by reason of the words of the king and his lords, came into the banquet house, and the queen spake and said, O king, live forever. Let not thy thoughts trouble thee, nor let thy countenance be changed. There is a man in thy kingdom, in whom is the spirit of the holy gods. And in the days of thy father, light and understanding and wisdom, like the wisdom of the gods, was found in him. Whom the king Nebuchadnezzar, thy father, 
The king, I say, thy father, made master of the magicians, astrologers, Chaldeans, and soothsayers. All right. Oh, verse 12 as well. For as much as an excellent spirit and knowledge and understanding, interpreting of dreams and showing of hard sentences and dissolving of doubts were found in the same Daniel, whom the king named Belteshazzar, now let Daniel be called and he will show the interpretation. All right. That Belteshazzar is not the same as Belshazzar. All right. Don't confuse those two. Okay. So Daniel, whose Babylonian name was Belteshazzar, uh, the queen calls, uh, asks, suggests that they, he, king call in Daniel. All right, so the answer here to our question number five is the queen. Now, for some reason, the queen was not present there at this, par, at this grand, grand banquet. Uh, it's possible, we don't know for this for sure, but it's possible that she may have been actually converted. This may have been the queen mother. Uh, who knew of what happened. She obviously knew what happened with Nebuchadnezzar and how, how he had been converted to the God of Daniel. And so she was not at this party, but she, was caught, she came in when she heard about the writing on the wall. And so, all right, number six. What position did Belshazzar offer to Daniel if he read and interpreted the writing? All right, let's read that. Continuing our story here, beginning in verse 13 through 16. Then was Daniel brought in before the king, and the king spake and said unto Daniel, Art thou that Daniel, which art of the children of the captivity of Judah, whom the king of my father brought out of Jewry? I have even heard of thee, that the spirit of the gods is in thee, and that light and understanding and excellent wisdom is found in thee. And now the wise men, the astrologers, have been brought in before me that they should read this writing and make known unto me the interpretation thereof. But they could not show the interpretation of the thing. And I have heard of thee that thou canst make interpretations and dissolve doubts. Now, if thou canst read the writing and make known to me the interpretation thereof, thou shalt be clothed with scarlet and have a chain of gold about thy neck and shalt be the third ruler in the kingdom. Wow, that's quite, a, that's quite an incentive, isn't it? That's quite a, a, a payoff. If you can just tell me what this writing up here means, do you think that writing was pretty important to the king that night? Absolutely. Thou shalt be the third ruler of the kingdom. Now, uh, there, of course, why would he be third? Uh, well, because Nebuchadnezzar, uh, there was... Bel, uh, I'm sorry, Belshazzar was king and his father also, Nabonidus, was king at the same time. They were both co-regents. They were known for, history tells us this. And so that's why he would, Daniel would be the, the next one, the third ruler of the kingdom. All right. So now what does Daniel, how does he respond to this? Before interpreting the writing, Daniel fearlessly reminds Belshazzar of Nebuchadnezzar's insanity because he failed to recognize and honor the God of heaven. Did Belshazzar already know this? Let's read the story here in beginning in verse 17 through 22. All right. Now, oh, oh, wait, I'm sorry. Let's go back to, oh, whoops. Let me find my place here. Uh, okay. Yeah, okay, verse 17. Then Daniel answered and said before the king, Let thy gifts be to thyself, and give thy rewards to another. Yet I will read the writing unto the king, and make known to him the interpretation. Let's pause there for a moment. Notice that Daniel turns down the king's offer. I mean, he, he, he says, Go, you know, that's not the reason I'm interpreting this for you. It's not for the rewards. You don't have to pay me off, king. I'll be happy to do God a service and to help you out, but it's not because you're paying me this rich reward. That's a very important point there. All right, going on in verse 18, it says, O thou king, the most high God gave Nebuchadnezzar thy father a kingdom and majesty and glory and honor. And for the majesty that he gave him, 
all people, nations, and languages trembled and feared before him. Whom he would, he slew, and whom he would, he kept alive, and whom he would, he set up, and whom he would, he put down. But when his heart was lifted up and his mind hardened in pride, he was deposed from his kingly throne, and they took his glory from him. And he was driven from the sons of men, and his heart was made like the beasts, and his dwelling was with the wild asses. They fed him with grass like oxen, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven, till he knew that the Most High God ruled in the kingdom of men, and that he appointeth over it whomsoever he will. And thou, his son, O Belshazzar, hast not humbled thine heart, though thou knewest all this. Wow. What an indictment. What a story. Let's see here. So yes, though thou knewest all this, so Belshazzar did know. He knew the history of what happened with, with Nebuchadnezzar, his, his grandfather. And the Bible calls him his father. So often they would do that. Grandfather, father would be considered a father. Um, and so Belshazzar knew of the history, but he did not surrender to God. He did not accept the God of heaven. And so there he was have, throwing this lavish party, drinking it up, and, and blaspheming God. And, uh, and this, is, this is what's getting, happening here now. All right. So what, did, what had Belshazzar done that had invoked the wrath of God? Interesting. Let's see what happens here. All right. So let's look at verse 23. Daniel continuing his dialogue with the king there, Belshazzar. Daniel says, but, so you knew all this, but, but hast lifted up thyself against the Lord of heaven, and they have brought the vessels of his house before thee, and thou and thy lords, thy wives, and thy concubines have drunk wine in them, and thou hast praised the gods of silver and gold, of brass, iron, wood, and stone which see not, nor hear, nor know. And the God in whose hand thy breath is, and whose are all thy ways, hast thou not glorified. Wow. Amazing. So there we are. Thou hast lifted up thyself against the Lord of heaven, and brought the vessels, the sacred vessels, from the, house, the temple in Jerusalem that had been stored there in, in uh, Babylon for a number of years. And they drunk Babylonian wine out of these and praised the gods of gold and silver. Drunk wine in them. Yeah. There, there are your answers there for number um, eight. Yeah. All right. So this was, this was the act this defiling act of mixing the sacred and the profane, of mixing the true worship of God with pagan worship, this mixing together of truth and error, that is what brought down the wrath of God upon Belshazzar. Mixing of the truth, because they have the sacred vessels from the temple, but they had Babylonian wine in them. That's a key point. We're going to need to understand that later when we go over to Revelation. All right, number nine. Give the meaning of the words that were written on the wall. Have you heard about the handwriting on the wall? Yeah, that's a saying that comes down to us today. This is from this story right here. The handwriting on the wall. Okay. So let's read about it in chapter 5, verses 25 to 28. Verse 25. Well, let's see. We'll start with 24. Uh, Daniel is continuing to talk here, and he says, Then was the part of the hand sent from him, and this writing was written. In other words, this hand was from God. This was God or, or an angel writing uh, this writing on the wall there. Verse 25. And this is the writing that was written. 
Meeny, meeny, tekel, you farson. This is the interpretation of the thing. Meaning, God hath numbered thy kingdom and finished it. Tekel, thou art weighed in the balances and art found wanting. Perez, thy kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and Persians. Wow, interesting. So Daniel interpreted it. Okay, here it is. A, meaning, God hath numbered thy kingdom and finished it. So that, and then this is we're on question nine. And B, thou art weighed in the balances and art found wanting. And C, Perez, thy kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and Persians. So here we see that God is announcing the fall of Babylon. And when, when was that fall going to happen? That very night. In fact, it was happening as he was talking to the king. And that, this, you know, historians, the, the Medes and Persians were very good about recording their history. And uh, scholars and historians and um, archaeologists have been able, been able to trace back all these things. And uh, we have the actual date of when this happened, October 12, 538 B.C. So that's 538 years before Christ. And uh, it, was, uh, it was in October, this time of year, October 12. That night, Babylon fell to the Medes and the Persians. And uh, let's see how that happened now. So how soon was the prophecy fulfilled? Let's read about it in Daniel 5, 30, and 31. Okay, I'll start in verse 29 because we lay up. Okay, let's start in verse 29. Then commanded Belshazzar, and they clothed Daniel with scarlet and put a chain of gold about his neck, made a proclamation concerning him that he should be the third ruler in the kingdom. So the king kept his word and gave him the reward. All right, verse 30. In that night was Belshazzar, the king of the Chaldeans, slain. And Darius, or Darius the Median, took the kingdom, being about threescore and two years old. All right, so... Right there it happened. That very night, uh, the, uh, yeah, the answer for A is that night. And, uh, okay, and uh, yeah, Dar Darius or Darius, depending on how you pronounce that, uh, it, it's uh, B there. And he was the Median. He was, uh, you know, the Medes and the Persians, the Persians, of course, are in the present-day Iran, um, and uh, Ruth used to live there when she was growing up. Her family worked there. This was before the revolution in the early 70s. And uh, you actually met some Medes there. They, have, they still have Medes in, in, in Iran. From, they're descended from the Medes and the Persians. Uh, and so it's interesting, the tribes that are still there. Um, so the Medes and the Persians had come together to uh, defeat Babylon there. And uh, Darius was the Medes, and, and the, the other, uh, the leader of the Persians was Cyrus. You've heard of Cyrus, right? We'll talk about him in just a moment here. So while this feast was going on, you see this picture here? Uh, what this is, is this right here is the river bed. This is the river, the Euphrates River, and the Euphrates River went actually under the walls of Babylon and, and they had built gates, uh, gates there that would close and so it would allow the water through but no people could come through there. And so the walls of Babylon were very, it was a mighty fort, fortified city and no one could uh, break through, no army could break through those walls. But the Persians, Cyrus, he was very ingenious and what he did is he diverted the river Euphrates upstream and created a temporary lake out in the desert there 
And that allowed for his armies to sneak in under the gates in the dry bed of the Euphrates River there. And uh, the, the guards were drunken and they were able to get through those gates there and, and take over the city. And, uh, you know, the Belshazzar and all his thousand lords, they were in there having a big party. They knew the army, the Medes and Persians were outside, but they were confident because their city was impregnable and uh, they had plenty of supplies and water and so forth and they thought they were good. But no, they, they uh, fell that night. God's word became, came true that night. And so Cyrus was uh, the one who led that out and he would later become king. They would kind of take turns between Cyrus and Darius, uh, the Medes and the Persians. Now, it's interesting, let's see here, I want to, okay, who became the new but ruler of Babylon? We read that already, okay, Darius the Median, okay, good. Now, let's, uh, let's look at a couple of texts here. Isaiah 45, did you know that, uh, that Cyrus was prophesied by God a hundred years before this event happened here in Daniel? So Isaiah was written and historians know this, uh, the, you know, the, the uh, book of Isaiah was actually written 100 years before, and in that book, and of course, you can, the, uh, the uh, Dead Sea Scrolls, they found the actual uh, Isaiah scroll there. They compared it word for word to the ones we have in our Bibles today, and essentially, it's not changed at all. I mean, there's a few minor word changes that don't mean any, you know, they don't mean any real difference. All right, so it's interesting. Let's look at this Isaiah 45. I have it here on the screen. And see what God said about this 100 years before. Listen to this. Thus saith the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have holden, to subdue nations before him. And I will loose the loins of kings to open before him the two-leaved gates. Those gates going under that wall there. And the gates shall not be shut. I will go before thee and make the crooked places straight. I will break in pieces the gates of brass and cut in sunder the bars of iron. And I will give thee the treasures of darkness and hidden riches of secret places that thou mayest know that I, the Lord, which call thee by thy name, am the God of Israel. For Jacob my servant's sake and Israel mine elect I have even called thee by thy name. I have surnamed thee. And what's that last part say? Though thou hast not known me. So God is saying, I'm going to use you, Cyrus, to free my people. And that's what he eventually did. You're going to be the deliverer of my people, even though you don't even know who I am. Or you don't know me. Uh, at least not yet. I think later on he did, but... Uh, so, interesting, very interesting. This is all prophesied 100 years before it happened. And then here, listen to this, Isaiah. That saith to the deep, be dry, and I will dry up thy rivers. Interesting. Historians tell us that's how Cyrus got into and took over Babylon. He dried up the Euphrates River. And here it is, prophesied 100 years before. Verse 28, that saith to, of Cyrus, he is my shepherd and shall perform all my pleasure, even saying to Jerusalem, thou shalt be built, and to the temple thy foundation shall be laid. Yeah, that's what Cyrus did. He compares him to a shepherd. There's a type of Christ here, a figure of Christ almost, between Cyrus and Jesus, who is our deliverer. Interesting, there's a lot of deep study there that we don't have time to go into. But um, yes, so, um, all right. So let's tuck that away in our memories and then go to the book of Revelation. Now we're gonna kind of transition to uh, how we apply this to our day and see what we can learn. Why are we studying the book of Daniel in the first place? Why would God put that chapter in there if we just, it's just a story from history, right? But it has clues for our day. Revelation 16, I have it on the screen here. 
Revelation 16, 12 through 16. And I will give you the context here. This is during the seven last plagues. And so it says, when it says here the sixth angel, that means we're already into the plagues. Uh, we're into the sixth plague. So there's only one more to go after this. So it's very late in, in uh, right up close to the second coming of Christ. All right, here it is. And the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and the water thereof was dried up, that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. Now I want you to think about that for a moment. Does this sound a little bit familiar? Yeah, this is a, 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 a obvious reference back to the events that happened there with the fall of literal Babylon in chapter 5 that we've just been reading about. There's the great river Euphrates, there's the water being dried up, and that allows the way of kings of the east, you know, the, the Medes and the Persians lived to the east of Babylon, the kings of the east could come through. Interesting. All right. That's very significant. We need to learn more about this. All right, going on. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. Unfortunately, we don't have time to delve into that right now. We'll do that later in a future lesson. For they are the spirits of devils working miracles, which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. Verse 15, behold, I come as a thief. So this is before the second coming still. This is, you know, those who treat, te teach the secret, the, the rapture and all that, pre-trib and all that. This doesn't match that. Jesus has not come yet as a thief. This, we're already into the sixth plague. All right, behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. And he gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue, Armageddon. So the, the, the battle of Armageddon is, is about to take place there in the sixth plague. All right, so the river Euphrates is dried up. Um, I think we're on number 11 here. Yeah, so if you want to look at number 11 and fill that out, it says the river Euphrates is dried up. Those are those two words there. And B, it prepares the way for the kings of the east. All right, so sorry, we kind of went forward and then now we're going back to Daniel here. Okay, but you see how they're tied together? You see how... The, what's going on over in, in, in Daniel informs us about what the book of Revelation is talking about. So we see that the same conditions that existed at the fall of ancient Babylon will exist again at the end time. So the drying up of the river Euphrates prepared the way for Cyrus and the armies who came in from the east. And having conquered Babylon, Cyrus eventually allowed God's people to go back to Palestine from the captivity. I'm reading at the bottom of page five in your lesson there. Thus he is seen as the deliverer of God's people. Once more in the book of Revelation, the river Euphrates is dried up. <clears throat> that which supports spiritual Babylon is dried up to prepare the way for the kings of the east, the mighty deliverer of God's people. And uh, it notes there that we're going to actually dive into this in more depth when we get to lesson number 25. So we'll get this again in more depth and more focus on Babylon in the book of Revelation. Number 12, uh, let's see here. Okay, what happens when the kings of the east come to deliver God's people? Revelation 16, 18, and 19. Let's read what that says. I have it on the screen here. And there were voices and thunders and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake, such as was not since men were upon the earth, so mighty an earthquake and so great. And the great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell, 
And great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. This is not talking about literal Babylon now because by the time John wrote the book of Revelation in about 90 AD, 90 years after, uh, that, that this, this actually is talking about Babylon had ceased to exist. The, the city was completely uh, not a city anymore. And it has not been built since. You know, there's a, there's a prophecy in Isaiah that said, and in Jeremiah that says that Babylon would never be rebuilt. You know, um, the uh, various people have tried to rebuild Babylon, literally, the city there, uh, including uh, yeah, uh, Hussein, right? Saddam. Saddam Hussein. He tried to rebuild the city of Babylon, literally, and... Uh, it just didn't work. It didn't happen. But the Bible said it would never be rebuilt, the actual literal city. So this is talking about a symbolic, a spiritual Babylon. Uh, we're going to study that more in the future, identifying that. Okay, so great Babylon came in remembrance before God. That's the answer to our question there, number 12. And... The same events that caused the fall of ancient Babylon will cause, cause the fall of Babylon at the time of the end. And we'll look at that here now. Okay, so what are the characteristics of modern Babylon? We're in that section here now. Um, and so I'll read this little section, on, uh, this little paragraph under there in your lesson. Page six, Revelation makes it very clear that there will be another Babylon at the time of the end. The Babylon spoken of in Revelation is not the same as the Babylon of Daniel's day. When Cyrus and Darius conquered Babylon, it became a heap of ruins and has remained so to the present day. The Bible foretells the rise of another Babylon, which will do the same to God's people as did ancient Babylon. Modern Babylon, according to the book of Revelation, is the final great oppressor of the people of God. Okay, so we'll... Uh, this kind of repeats what we just said. The same events that caused the fall of ancient literal Babylon will cause the fall of modern spiritual Babylon at the time of the end. Now, what does the Bible call Babylon? Revelation 17, 1 and 2. Okay, I have that on the screen here. Um, and this is the, the next chapter in Revelation after the one we just read. It says there, and there came one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, meaning the seven last plagues, and he talked with me, this is John speaking now, saying unto me, come hither, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. Now, I, do you notice some similarities here? What were they doing back there in Daniel 5? They were drinking, weren't they? Drinking wine. And uh, it was the wine of Babylon. And here we have wine being, again, notice who's involved. Kings of the earth and Babylon. So Babylon is not the kings of the earth. It's a different entity. But they're kind of working together. In fact, they have an illicit relationship that's called fornication. Uh, all right, interesting. We need to delve into that some more. So the answer there, the great whore that sitteth upon many waters. We need, to, we need to decode some of these things. So let's see what we can learn. What do the waters that the whore sits on represent? According to Revelation 17, verse 15. And I have that also. And he saith unto me, now here it is. This is the interpretation right here in the book. You don't have to guess at it. And he saith unto me, the waters which thou sawest where the whore sitteth are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. Do you remember where uh, the beasts that in Daniel we studied where the beasts would come out of the water? Remember we talked about that? That was meant it was a populated area, large populated area, you know, groupings of people. 
And then the beast came out of the earth in contrast. There's an unpopulated area. Yeah, so this is talking about the waters, you know, you've heard the expression, you, you, you huge crowd out there, you could say a sea of faces. You know, so we use that same terminology sometimes. But water represents this huge population of people. And that, that is the support system for Babylon. One day it's going to dry up. Interesting. We're going to learn more about that. So this uh, entity called Babylon, or uh, whore, sits on or rests upon the, uh, all the people. The people support this system, in other words. The waters are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. There's the answer for uh, the question. And that is question number 14. Peoples, multitudes, nations, tongues. So Babylon controls these people. Uh, and it's called a whore or a harlot because of her illicit relationships. And we need to dig in, delve into that just a little bit more as well. So our next slide, our next question. Are we ready? All right. Number 15, what is the great sin of Babylon, spiritual Babylon? Revelation 17, verse 2. All right. We just read it, in fact, a few minutes ago. Here's the answer. With whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So that's the answer to 15. Fornication and wine and fornication again. Yeah. All right, so Babylon's great sin is fornication or adultery. Adultery is an illicit relationship. And obviously in this situation is not a physical adultery, but it's a spiritual adultery. Spiritual adultery is an illicit, I'm reading by the way at the bottom of page six. Spiritual adultery is an illicit relationship that combines the worship of God with false worship. In Daniel 5, we saw that ancient Babylon acted defiantly against God with an illicit relationship mixing elements of the worship of God with the worship of pagan deities. Spiritual Babylon's fornication or adultery, likewise, is an illicit relationship that mixes elements of the worship of God with pagan practices. There is nothing that brings down the wrath of God more than an illicit relationship of truth and error. Babylon purports to worship God, but has mixed truth with error, paganism with Christianity. This can only invite the wrath of God. And so there we see some insight into what these terms mean. And so we see here Satan's technique. Uh, if he is, is his best technique to just put out apps, you know, all error, 100% error? No, he doesn't do that. He mixes truth and error. That's his most potent mixture. He comes as an angel of light. And so in the end times, his masterpiece is to come on like a Christian, not as an atheist, not as a, some, a, a total pagan, but someone, and that's why Antichrist is actually this is evidence for why Antichrist is actually a mixture of Christianity and paganism. Uh, and so it's a mixture of a little error but with truth, making error appear spiritual, religious, blessing you while living in sin. That's a key, um, one of the key of philosophies or teachings of the system is you can sin and still be saved. Uh, you can, you know, receive forgiveness and just keep right on doing the sins, you know, essentially. Um, all right, there's many other errors that we'll talk about in the future, but okay. So now I'm going to pause here just a moment. And if you want to, you can, you probably can't read that. It's, it's too small on the screen there. Uh, but if you look at your handout, if hopefully you have a handout, uh, 
and this details some things, and I don't think we're going to have time to go through all this, but we'll go through a little bit. This is something that you can take home, and oh, do you, does anyone need one, by the way? Yeah, raise your hand. Okay, one, okay, well, there's... And in the back there. Okay. So this is uh, looking at the fall of Babylon, the parallels between Daniel 5 and Revelation. And this is very interesting because here we see on the left-hand side, we see the, the, the story of, that we just read about in Daniel 5. But over in Revelation, we see how that's uh, used to symbolize a false system of worship in the end times. Okay, number one, we have literal Babylon. Over on the right side, Revelation, it's spiritual Babylon or symbolic Babylon. And it appears actually six times. It's interesting, the number six there. Uh, that word Babylon appears in the book of Revelation six times. All right. Number two, Babylon in, in the Old Testament, in our story that in Daniel 5, is a literal local place. But in Revelation, it's a symbol for a global spiritual system. That is a very key principle in interpreting things in the book of Revelation. What was local and literal in the Old Testament becomes global and spiritual or symbolic in the New, Test in the New Testament, in the book of Revelation. So, for example, the city of Babylon, there was a literal city right there, you know, uh, and, the, and there was a literal river Euphrates but when you come over to Revelation don't look at it that way it's symbolic it's the river is not a literal river it's symbolic of something in fact it's symbolic of people nations tongues people it tells us they're right there and so don't look for you know, oh you know somebody says oh you know did you know that they built a dam up in Turkey and they have dammed up the river Euphrates and that's a fulfillment of Bible prophecy no, that's not a fulfillment of Bible prophecy. It is not talking about literal Babylon or literal Euphrates River. It's talking about a symbolic, uh, over in the book of Revelation, it's symbolic and global, not just a local thing. All right, so that's an important principle. We'll come back to that in, in later lessons. Uh, number two, number three, Babylon attempts to deceive God's people. And that happens in Revelation as well. Babylon persecutes God's people, number four. And uh, same thing in Revelation. There is forced worship, um, number five. That's also true in Revelation. There's forced worship to the image to the beast. In verse seven, uh, or number seven, I'm sorry, or number six, there's universal worship is decreed. Same thing in Revelation. All the world is required to worship the beast or the image to the beast, receive his mark, and so forth. Number seven, there's a death penalty for those who will not worship in both cases. Number eight, literal Babylon comes up to judgment, God's judgment, and is found, what? Wanting, and Babylon falls. Same thing in, in uh, Revelation. Babylon falls spiritually first, and then literally it falls in Revelation chapter 18. In fact, the, almost the whole chapter 18 is about the destruction of Babylon. Okay, the Euphrates, Euphrates is the life of Babylon, number nine, and the great horror of Babylon sits on many waters. The waters are dried up, number 10. History reveals how Cyrus diverted the Euphrates River, enabling him to capture Babylon. And in the sixth plague, we see the river Euphrates dries up there. Her support system is removed. The people turn on Babylon, in other words. And it details there in, later in chapter 17 how that happens. Okay, number 11, Cyrus and Darius are kings from the east. They conquer Babylon and ultimately set God's people free. They decree, they issue a decree to restore Israel and the temple. That's talked about in Ezra and Isaiah there. And so in Revelation 16, 12, the way of the kings of the east is prepared. Who are the kings of the east? Well, in the Old Testament, it was Cyrus, the Lord's anointed, comes from the east to deliver, opens the two-leaf gates under the wall of Babylon. 
who raised up the righteous man from the east and gave nations before him and made him rule over kings. He gave them as the dust to his sword, Isaiah 41, verse 2. Over on the right-hand side, Jesus is the Lord's anointed. He comes from the east also. For as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Also the sealing angel comes from the east. All right, so you see there. And then, of course, God's faithful live through the time of trouble and are victorious with the conquerors from the east. And the same thing happens in Revelation. Okay, well, we covered the whole thing. Uh, all right, that's just for your future reference. I hope you found that interesting. All right, number 16. We're on question 16. We're not, we, we're getting close. All right, number 16. What does God call this harlot who defies God by mixing paganism and Christianity? And we saw that, didn't we? Babylon the Great. That, that's what God calls him, this system. Babylon the Great. This apostate system of religion that mixes paganism with Christianity and yet claims to worship God. And so, yeah. All right. What, number 17, what message does God proclaim about modern spiritual Babylon? And this is in Revelation 18. And this was our scripture reading this morning, by the way. Uh, I don't have it on, on the screen. I do have it on the screen, but it's just not the whole thing. Okay, you remember our scripture reading this morning that Ruth read? Uh, the great angel came down, lightened the earth with his glory, and he cried with a mighty voice, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become the habitation of devils. So, interesting. Okay, so there's your answer to number 17. And then... 18, how widespread will the influence of mighty modern spiritual Babylon be in the last days? All nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. The entire world has followed this system in one way or another, except those whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life, it says. All right. Number 19. What, and this is really key right here, what loving message does God send to his people who are in Babylon? And this is, uh, this is something we have to look at. It's very important. Do you recognize, do you, do you catch the significance of the fact that God's people are still in Babylon? So we're not talking about just a pure pagan or spiritualistic or, you know, this is God's people are still make, mixed up in this system. All right, and so God is, is going to, he has a message for them here. Uh, Revelation 18, 4 and 5, I'll read it here. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. All right. So the answer there is, come out of her, my people. Number 20. If you ever find yourself ensnared by this Babylonian system that unites paganism and Christianity... Will you heed the warning of God's word to come out of Babylon? Amen. Yes. And maybe, maybe we don't realize we're in that system. Um, I pray you're not. But um, yeah, this is something. God calls us. You know, he doesn't call us to, to reform Babylon or try to, try to fix Babylon. He says, come out of her. So we see here. Jesus is calling us to come out of Babylon to true worship. Okay, so to sum it up, what have we learned from today's lesson? All that purports to be truth may not be truth. 
There was an apostasy in the days of historical Babylon, and spiritual Babylon represents a major apostasy today. In religious, spiritual matters, the majority is almost always wrong. And so Babylon will mix truth and error, the sacred and the profane. It will mix uh, paganism with the truth of God, and it will mix church and state together. You remember we talked about the kings of the earth. The Babylon commits fornication with the kings of the earth. And so church and state mixing together is a major feature of this fallen system. So that's something that, you know, the United States was founded upon the concept of separation of church and state and the First Amendment, the Constitution, and this is very important. And part, a major significant part of the end times is when we see those coming together and uh, that is a signal to us that, uh, that the end is really wrapping up. And uh, we see signs of that happening today. And uh, let's just keep our eyes open and focused. We have much more to learn. Next, sab next uh, Sabbath, we will be looking at conflict over true worship. Now, last couple times ago, we had conflict over false worship. Now, this is conflict over true worship. So come next week, prepared for another a uh, lesson that will teach us a lot about our days as well. Let's, uh, let's go ahead now and we'll have our closing hymn and then we'll pray. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for revealing to us the history and the future in your word. We can trust it and we can trust you. You are in control and we, Lord, we ask that you will please be in control of our lives. Help us to surrender to you, to follow Jesus, our Savior and our Lord, and that you will protect us and be that shelter in the time of storm. Thank you, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.